All right. We're still waiting on people to uh, join the meeting. However, in the interest of time and not to um, cut Connect Consulting Services short, I'll go ahead and start. So good morning and welcome to the training. Cybersecurity is a team sport. How all health center staff can support their organizations against a cyber attack. My name is Jonathan McDell and I am the Business Intelligence Manager here at the Nevada Primary Care Association. Nevada Primary Care Association helps community health centers provide exceptional, exceptional medical, dental, and behavioral health care to Nevadans by advocating policy changes, providing training and technical assistance, and creating economies of scale through pro program management. For more information regarding our PCA or to subscribe to our newsletter, please visit us at nvpca.org. This presentation is in partnership between the Nevada Primary Care Association and Connect Consulting Services. I would like to take just a moment to thank Connect Consulting Services for helping to coordinate this training. So a uh, huge thank you to uh, Karen and Steve. Before we get started, I would like to go over the logistics and housekeeping items for today's training. Please type your name and organization into the chat box. You will have an opportunity to submit questions to the presenter by typing them into the chat box at any time. During the presentations, please mute your phone or computer so we do not have feedback or background noise. Also, please do not put your phone on hold or we might be able to hear your hold music. At the end of today's session, you will be directed to a quick evaluation. Please take two minutes to complete it as the information will help us better serve you. All right, I will now turn over the presentation to Steve. Thank you, Jonathan. Let me just pull up my slides here. And I'll check to make sure we can actually see my slides. So can everybody see my slides? Mm -hmm. yes. Perfect. yes, sir, looks good. All right, and Brandy, are you gonna keep bringing people on board? I see some uh, admits here, uh, or you or Karen can do yep, that. I will be doing it. Fantastic. Well, again, thanks everybody for joining. We have an exciting presentation here and cybersecurity should be on top of mind. Uh, every, every week you hear about something getting hacked or breached and, and you might be saying, well, what's in it for me or why do I care? Well, it's affecting all of us because the hackers have gotten really smart and they know that you're now the door uh, to your organization where the crown jewels are, which could be patient data, financial data, your data, your company's information. It's just not a good situation. So we're, we're here to give you some best practices and, and walk away with something tangible. So this is about me, uh, why you read those words. Um, I, I enjoy skiing and uh, uh, great food, travel. And uh, again, Jonathan's already volunteered to be my, uh, my, my question taker, so we make this interactive. But if you're dying to jump in with a comment, a question, or a suggestion, please use the chat tool, and one of the team here will fish it out. Uh, and I uh, have a passion for training and enlightenment because myself, I started out as an engineer, a physicist, and I ended up in an executive uh, uh, outbound role. And wow, you know, something happened to me on the way of the ball game. So today, <clears throat> bringing it back to you, uh, we're going to give you some sense of how hackers think. It's important to understand the enemy. It's important to understand the foe. And they do think differently than they have in the past. You, if you've heard of something called a firewall, almost every home router has one. Every enterprise has one. Every hospital has one. It's a way to block bad traffic. Hackers know how to get around firewalls. That's the point. So we're going to learn a little bit. It's not too deep. It's just enough for you to understand that. We're going to talk about tactics they use to steal information. That's called ransomware. Uh, the tactic is also called malware. It's things that sit on your tools and, and collect information. We're going to give you a checklist and a way to think uh, about your daily life. And you can take this home to your families as well, because your identity uh, can be stolen. And once it is, it's a lot of work to get your identity back. So again, these best practices work for you as well. And then we'll give you some sense of how to collaborate with your HR team and your HR department, because uh, your IT team and your HR department, because at the end of the day, they own the policies in your organization. And don't assume, I think they would appreciate questions. And, and, and what they don't want is no questions, no input, but, and then bad things happen. Again, I, my experience has been IT teams and HR teams 
are all about policy and procedure. Those are good words, they're not bad words. So this construct of a loop here <clears throat> is actually meant to show a modern attack. And we're not gonna go into the technology of this. That would take another class and, and a lot of time. And I don't think we need to go there today. The point is hackers used to grab and go through the firewall. They hack through that firewall or there was no firewall. Today, they come in and lurk. They literally sit there on purpose. The colonial pipeline, you might remember that from last year, the gas line that was attacked in Southeast of the country. The, the hackers were in the system for six months before they actually did the damage because it took them a while to figure out where the crown jewels are. Why does that matter to us today? Well, first of all, and Jonathan knows this because we were pre-chatting about this, they look for the weakest link. Today, guess what? You're the weakest link. It, it's really true. No matter how many IT systems can be put in place, if we don't have an awareness of how those tactics are being deployed on our smartphones or in our laptops, you're actually leaving the door open. So at the end of the day, why we have this team approach here is uh, I wanna give everybody that sense that <clears throat> this is not a punt it to HR and IT. <laughs> this is not punt it to the executive uh, team. This is really uh, look in the mirror a little bit and own it. And especially folks in healthcare, you're used to guarding uh, patient data and, and, and every system you log into, you're aware of this already. So the idea of HIPAA was really a pioneering way to bring in a sense of personal security and IT process, but now it goes past that. So we're gonna give you many, many, many examples as we go through the presentation. And here's the high level checklist that we're gonna go through today. We don't need to read this. Um, I'm just gonna make sure that again, by the end of the day, I want you all to walk away with a few ideas that you can do at home, ask your family, check with your kids in particular, make sure everybody's being safe. All right. so. Um, first topic here is the idea of um, uh, it, the social engineering. We're going to spend a few slides on that. We're going to talk a bit about being connected, whether it be in the office or on the road. We're going to talk about the fact that technology continues to evolve. This makes it harder for us, but it makes you, uh, you can become a thought leader on this subject very easily. Uh, it's what is threat intelligence and what are some of the privacy regulations? All right, so here's what we mean by social engineering. Right. It's not necessarily what you think. Yes, it's about social media, but it's actually this mentality. Besides the hackers coming in and, and lurking, what are they looking for? They're trying to profile you. So if your password is password123 or your dog named uh, uh, Dolly in our case, and you put some of those personal attributes on the web, they're going to find it and they're going to use it against you. And so we need to be aware that people are trying to understand you as a door into the organization. So the less you share specifically about your friends and your family in public domains, I know it might sound a little bit bad, it's definitely anti-community, but in particular with social media, those tools are routinely scrubbed for nuggets that can be cobbled together to understand you and then attack you as a way in. Um, Jonathan, you have any quick questions or comments so far? For the team here? Nothing so far. Okay. And we're, we're pretty high level, Jonathan. I didn't expect it. They just take a, take a breath and stop. So uh, the idea of connected, again, it's become quite a challenge, right? It's not just you sitting in the corporate office. That network's pretty well connected uh, and protected, except for the idea of a, a rogue email that we'll talk to. But when you're at home or you're in a Starbucks working remotely, as many of us like to do today, you have to ask yourself who has access to that Wi-Fi connection. The data that goes from your device through the internet is in many, many cases unencrypted, meaning it can be read. It's, it's what we call plain text and, and, and therefore anybody can sniff or copy that traffic and see important information. So question one, uh, should you use a VPN? I'd highly recommend it. Uh, if your corporate uh, environment offers it, you should use it. Yes, it's more work, but there's a reason for it. They're giving you a means to send data that's protected. Second, should you encrypt data? Yes, if you can easily, I highly recommend it because now you're making that information harder to see. Again, literally, if it's unencrypted, it's readable, right? Passwords go shoot right across the network. And uh, if it's unencrypted and unprotected by a VPN, uh, you're, you're giving people an easy door. So these are things you need to work out with your IT team and your HR department. These should be policies. Again, if they're not, raise your hand and say, hey, 
I'd like to even participate in helping craft a policy because at the end of the day, they do want our help. Why? Because if it's hard, if it's a challenge, nobody's going to do it. So this is why those departments are actually actively engaging employees who want to raise their hand and say, help me make a policy that you think everybody will deploy because it's about deploying the policy and ensuring that policy is uh, working. Now, um, again, th this, is, this is kind of a double click on the last slide that uh, you really do need to consider your smartphone, your tablet as a door into your organization as well as your personal life. And I, I highly encourage folks to do something as simple as lock your phone. It's not just keeping your kids off the phone so they're playing games or whatever. <laughs> In my case, possibly buying things on Amazon uh, without permission. But um, it's actually more important than that. What if you leave your phone on BART or, or public transportation or in your car and your car is broken into? Phone has an incredible amount of information on it. Think of, do you do banking with your phone? Does your, your phone number get recognized by your banking institution? This is how your personal information can get copied and stolen and lose your financial wealth. But more importantly, they now have a lot of ways to present themselves as you. This can take forever to get out of the, the system and correct. So it's more of a warning, just think about it. Again, there are reasons that they have the eyeball or the face recognition or the password or thumb uh, fingerprint coding now. It's easy once you do it and it gives you a lot of protection. So when you lose your phone, no one can get in, okay? All right, this should apply to all of our friends here uh, in the healthcare space uh, as well, but um, uh, Social or sorry, threat intelligence is something your IT team is almost certainly bringing in uh, because uh, bad websites get collected by third parties like Proofpoint, so a leading brand, and then they get resold and your IT team will then look through those domains and so, uh, basically filter those out of your inbound traffic and, and highlight email that has that information in it. It's a, it's a first line of defense and it's one way to help save us all from clicking on suspicious email. If that's set up well, you're in good shape, but even, even with good systems, it still sneaks through. And so step one, if you see something odd, grab it, copy it, don't click on it, but just copy it with your mouse, throw it onto Google. Google is a wonderful warehouse uh, and a lot of people write up scams and, and you'll quickly see is somebody else seeing that offer, somebody else seeing that information. So. Main message is don't click and go, copy and paste. <laughs> copy it and paste it into Google. My gosh, don't click on it. We'll give you some really clear examples here um, that, um, uh, that will make it obvious, I, I hope. Now, again, this is what I meant about HIPAA. I got ahead of myself there. The whole idea is that there is a wealth of information um, beyond HIPAA compliance that can be used against you and your organization. I already talked about banking on your phone, banking on the web, your credit cards, all that information, your medical information, and again, social media, right? The obvious example is, hey, I'm skiing right now. Guess what? My house is empty. But think about that from what you post about your organization, your activities, code words that you may not be realizing that are actually really important ways to figure out information and how it's protected in your organization. You just need to be careful. All right, um, this is really simple and it may not apply to people who are working from home, uh, but as we go back to the office, right, when you bring a visitor into the organization, uh, the cleaner the office is, of course, the neat freaks in the office will be happy, but you don't want stray information lying around. Again, think of HIPAA, if somebody's patient data is sitting out, we all know that's not allowed but take that to the next level. Uh, programs, strategies, passwords, right? The old movie where you look at the high school desk and you open up the drawer and all of a sudden the passwords for changing your grades are there. Folks, you can't do that, right? There are lots of tools to help you hide and protect your passwords in the cloud as a much better process than leaving them with sticky pads on your, on your machine and on your desk. People will go into your organization to spy on you. This, this can happen. Um, the other idea is uh, the idea of uh, devices and, and, and stolen. And a couple of us on the call have had their laptop stolen. Uh, this is an immediate event. Your laptop, your tablet, your phone is stolen. You have to call your IT department immediately. They can shut down things centrally and prevent a lot of data uh, breach. 
Also, immediately file a police report. This is important for you as an individual, uh, as I found out when this happened to me. It is a gift, federal law. If you have a police report that says any of your devices were stolen, that have personal information on it, you now have a get out of jail free card. If anybody steals your data, you can fly up, flash that police report and say, well, my laptop was stolen and such and such a date. You are no longer financially responsible for any damage. Very important. Federal law, beautiful protection of being a U.S. citizen. I had no clue when my laptop was stolen four years ago. And now I still keep that report because I know my data was on that laptop. I know someday it's going to come back to haunt me. I have a, I have a, a, a legal weapon to protect me from financial loss. So that's, a, that's another hook. But again, the, the call to action is any device is stolen. You have two places to report it, your company's IT department and get a police report. So we've gone through a lot of this stuff already. We're trying to, uh, you know, every organization has competitive information. Every organization has intellectual property, personal information, financial reporting, and um, my video's over the last one there. Uh, the others, it could be anything, and it's probably uh, very specific to every organization. Help do some brainstorming and fill it in. What's the point? A lot of what I've already talked about is consistent across these, right? So what we're gonna do now is change gears a bit and start to look at very specific examples because I want to train you. I want you to walk away saying, hey, and have a contest in the office. When everybody sees an email, ask each other, hey, what do you guys think before we all click on this, right? So the first one is um, tiered access. This, again, is very, very important. If you've heard of the term, I'm an admin on the tool, I feel smart, or I'm just a user on the tool. That's multi-tiered, uh, multi, uh, multi-levels of authentication and, and administration. It's done on purpose. If you're using Salesforce, for example, typically only the power user is the admin because they can change anything. And you might just be a regional person entering CRM information for your specific clients. The tiering is meant to contain badness and ensure that only the right people have access to do changes or exporting information. Pretty basic uh, application behavior in today's modern world of software as a service and software applications, it's mindful. So if you see that and you don't see the tiering organization, again, challenge IT and say, why aren't we doing that? And by the way, if the password is ad admin123 or, or password123, we're going to talk in a little bit here why that is the most commonly tested password by hackers. So that's an obvious thing that needs to get changed. Steve? All right, we're going to get into Steve? quizzes. Oh, yes, please. This Question. is Karen. We have hey, a better question. Love questions. Rima yeah. Nayak, she, she asked, do you have a website you could recommend to check URLs or, that are safe? Thank you. Yeah, said. yeah. The, two, two answers there. Great question, and thanks for asking that. Number one is, is, is literally just toss it into Google and see what Google comes back with. But uh, another great company, and I don't mean to pick favorites here. I'm, I'm not an employee, and nor am I a stockholder in Proofpoint. But Proofpoint has a really nice, easy-to-use website you can uh, stick an URL in there, uh, a domain request that you see, and, and they can give you some immediate feedback as well. Uh, so that's a great question. Again, we all need to know what these tools are. Uh, now, so we're going to change into a little bit more Socratic method, one of my favorites, and Jonathan has volunteered to be the brunt of these questions, so the rest of you can keep your own score. So here we go, Jonathan, our first question. <laughs> uh, and, and it's a pretty straightforward one. This is back to the clean office, right? We've got an office. We've got people coming in. Uh, you know, what do you think? Should we leave the stuff on the table? You know, hey, it's it's it, we're gonna make it nice and polished. They won't read through anything. Number two, should we have everything clean, including cleaning off the whiteboards and you know, set it up with clean pads, nothing written down? Or or three, do you think we should um, do some kind of combination and and, and worry about the, the cleaning crew coming in later in the day? Which one do you think it is? A, B, or C? One, two, or three? I would say to clean off the yeah. whiteboard and take away any leftover notes or printed materials before the meeting begins. That is exactly right. And then boom, hey, 100% so far, my friend. I mean, that's <laughs> basic, guys. But again, that, that's part of what I'm trying to educate you on is that if we all took 10 mm -hmm. minutes out and looked at that email before we click on it or open it and we looked at the, the office before we had visitors, it really is the 80-20 rule. You'll, you'll find that you'll dramatically reduce your risk. Okay, Jonathan, you're doing well. You're on a roll here. Here we are. This is a tougher one because everybody wants to be polite. So I'm walking through a badged system. A lot of companies have these these days. It's an ideal security mechanism. 
and someone's behind me saying, hey, Steve, you look like the right guy. I saw you on the website. Can you help me get in? I don't have a, a card, but I have a meeting with HR. I, I, I just you know, don't have the right resources. So again, should we open the door with our badge as we should and politely hold the door and let the other person walk in first? Because you know that's the way I was raised. That's the way to do it. Or number two, open the door with your badge and hold it behind you so that the other person can enter or move in easily. You know, hey, let me open it for you. Or three, open the door with our badge and politely tell the person, well, sorry, you know, you really need to call upstairs and you really need to have, uh, get your own badge. What do you think, Jonathan? I would have to say option three, open yeah. the door with your badge and politely tell the other person that they have to enter with their own badge. That's right. And, and this, uh, if you ever happen, have the chance to go to uh, Wall Street, uh, which I've done many times, and you go into the big banks there, trust me, folks, <laughs> you don't get through the front door and nobody will let you in. It's really tight security, especially after 9-11. So it's, uh, this should be obvious. It's a little bit terse. It's a little bit anti-community, but you really don't know. And again, think of that social engineering. Care, uh, uh, if, 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 if people look up my social media, they know my face, they know my name. They can make that up and say, Steve, I, I know you're here. I know you work, yeah, right? That's what I mean by social engineering. They've pieced enough information together to make you feel comfortable. Boom, now you've given them a weak link and, and the whole situation is lost. Very bad. All right, so fishing. This is not about a line, a hook and a sinker and grabbing some nice uh, bass out of the river. This is, IT spells it differently. Uh, because the concept is the same, we are fishing for information, but to avoid confusion, it's spelled with a P-A-H, right? A little bit of history there for you. You can look it up on Wikipedia. And the idea is not just, you know, you'll hear all kinds of words, ransomware, malware, phishing. At the end of the day, you as a user and as an attack vector, as we say in the space, meaning you're a door that people are trying to get into, the mindset is the same you're going to be sent fraudulent tactics and techniques to get you to interact when you shouldn't. The idea of malware means that you've now released code into your, your tools or your environment that will now infiltrate your entire enterprise. That's bad. The idea of ransomware is to infiltrate an account so that they eventually find the crown jewels and now threaten you to release that information if you're a healthcare or a financial institution and they want ransomware, meaning they want money to give you that data back. They, some cases, don't give you the data back, right? It's a never-ending bribery scheme. So it's a real rat's nest when you fall into that trap. The idea of phishing is the tactic. So all those kind of play together. The point is, if you learn the tricks that we're going to go through, you avoid all these things. And uh, there was a famous example, talking about IT again, at the UCSF Institute here in San Francisco, where a research group had a server with very important data on it. It was not backed up or owned by IT. They did not connect those dots. They were ransomware. They'd lost their data. They actually paid a million dollars to get their data back. That was bad IT process and procedure and a, and a rogue group not really understanding the value of working with IT. Shameful and un unfortunate, but real. In the paper, very embarrassing for everybody. Again, the, what's the real point of your C-level folks? They don't want to be in the paper about this stuff, guys. So we got to keep the C-level folks out of, the, out of jail and out of the paper. That's, that's the other point. All right. So some, some training. Now, this is a lot of information on this slide. And it also um, gives you a sense of how tricky these people are. And I'm going to give you some new tricks today. Just because there's an, a logo in the email does not mean it's real. Uh, and because I do a lot of e-commerce stuff on my Comcast email, um, I have hundreds of examples and you'd be surprised. I'm, I must get four or five fake emails a week and they all look like this. Trick number one is look at who sent it, right? Up here on the, where my mouse is uh, waving. Hopefully you can see my mouse circling around that. You wanna be sure that it really has the syntax of amazon.com or support at amazon.com. If it has something like xyzamazonsys.com, that's bogus. It's going to be clean if it's real. So number one, look at who sent it to you and be very, very, very picky. Anything that's not right, it's a flag. It's that simple. The second thing I want you to point out, you may not know this with your mouse, but if you have your mouse over a hyperlink, this is called a hyperlink, and if the text says, Jonathan's a good guy, but when you hover over it with your mouse and it shows something else, that's a masking attempt by the hacker trying to fool you to redirect you to a bad site 
but they put the right message on the hyperlink. Okay, that's an IT trick. It's a web trick. It's really simple technology, and it's really easy to get fooled by it. So warning sign one, domain, the resender looks wrong. I hover, ooh, ooh, something tricky here. Two reasons I'm out. Third is, look at who it's coming. Look at the, the salutation here. Doesn't look real either. They're going to know who you are. They're going to say, Jonathan, dear Jonathan. Right? If it's anything else, suspicious. So that's three strikes you're out here in California. That's no good. Uh, any questions on that right away? Jonathan, was this news into you or are you an informed cybersecurity expert already? You can answer either way. I would say um, everyone who claims to be an informed cybersecurity expert are usually the ones that eventually fall over something. You get, you know, that hubris. But uh, looking at this email, what came to mind was in our organization, what I've seen is the email's legitimate. Where it came from might be legitimate. The link might link to Adobe, and then they have the phishing link from a legitimate website. Great example, by the way. It could be one of these three things, right? This one actually was a triple header. This was a great example because all three things are bogus. Here's another one. Um, again, it, it's terminology and it's important, folks, but you really do want to look all the way over to the string over here. And there's a, there was an advancement in, in web technology to add an S. HTTP colon is old news. HTTPS colon is the right thing to see. A rogue site, a rogue hacker, we use less expensive technology at times. That S means secure. It's important. A real company has to use S today to be compliant with many, many, many global regulations and, and policies. So it's another little trick. The other trick here, PayPal, you know, it's a great app. I use it. Um, spelling errors. No major corporation in the world will send you an email with a typo in it. Just doesn't happen. Uh, they have a lot of people checking that. And if it does happen, you'll see an immediate, sorry for the typo email right after, right? So again, quality matters. A lot of this stuff is offshore and English is not the primary language. Typos can be common. The stories are true. This is done in Russia. This is done in North Korea. This is done in Iran. This is done in parts of Southeast Asia where labor is cheap, okay? So that that is not fake. Uh, it's real. There are click farms and and hacker farms in these countries that make money. That's part of, that's part of the story. It, it is absolutely true. You can actually see the traffic if you get deep into IT where it's coming from. Uh, this is actually from someone at my organization. This is very common. And this is kind of what you were alluding to, Jonathan. This, this email up here, look who it's from. It, it, it looks like a person, um, uh, it, again, it looks like Chang Ling Liu, the CEO, but the domain doesn't match, but it still looks like a good email. I mean, come on, that could be a, a good email address and it must be if it came to me, but that's clearly someone who's trying to get uh, uh, an employee to send money or take action from a, a fake CEO. There's many examples that have been written up in the news. There were many companies who lost hundreds of thousands of dollars last year where the CFO was spoofed Email Jonathan, Jonathan, I need you to process a check for this amount right now. It's urgent. I'm sorry, I'm on my Gmail account. I'm at, a, I'm at an event. And people just took action. So again, it's the same idea. When you see a, a high profile person in your organization asking you to do something around money or files or data, really look carefully at where it's coming from. All right, the, let's keep going here. I, I pointed that out. I got some animation there. I forgot about it. All right, this one uh, you can actually see is, is actually from me. And this is mine. I was kind of proud of this one because it looked really clean. Jonathan, what do you th what's wrong with this one? Give me, give me some tips here. Let's, again, let's do the Socratic method and make it interactive. There's a couple of things wrong with this one. Well, let me zoom in real quick. Yeah, it's kind of hard to see one so, of them. Yeah. Yep. yeah, dear customer, they don't know your name. Yep. Help custo hyphen CCST5 and the domain name is wrong in the email address. Yep. It is eh, August 1st. The time is correct. It's not like at two in the morning. So that looks okay. And it's to support at netflix.com, not you. Exactly. So you extra credit it, for one more that I highlighted here. Let's see. So it's a bit, a bit of a teaser. <laughs> you might say it's questionable when I highlight it, but it's worth pointing out to people. Payment is capitalized. No, it's which a, is a little strange too. It, it's it's the call to action actually in this case. So let's highlight. So yeah, ah. the email. It's the call to action, right? 
Um, it's again, unlikely that a provider is going to tell you, how do you get, how do you update your apps on your mobile phone these days? Your provider tells you that, right? Or the app updates itself or gives you a query. It's unlikely you're going to get an email that says, and again, that's very suspicious when they send you an email saying, update your account now or take action on your account now, especially text folks. I don't have any uh, images on that, but I've been getting some nice AT&T emails <laughs> over the last six months. I know they're fake and I've even gotten Citibank uh, texts. There is a new uh, attack out there. Does everybody know what a SIM card is? It's, it's part of your phone, right? And um, some of these attacks coming in through text are meant to hijack your SIM card. It's back to that same point. That's now a company. Mm. And if you use your phone like uh, we do in the Garrison House for a lot of activities, now they have a portal to a lot of applications through your phone. Uh, this is how they can change from you. If you're an AT&T phone carrier to Verizon, next thing you know, they're, they're on Verizon. You're getting, um, you're not even getting that bill, but they're using your phone to change your um the example I read about was the person, uh, their, their deed of their house uh, was changed ownership. This stuff happens, right? It's, it's again, it, it's scary. So I'm not trying to make everybody, please sleep well tonight, because why? You've been trained, so you're more aware. Yesterday, you're supposed to have uh, uh, nightmares. Today, you're like, I'm enlightened, right? Okay, so Jonathan, here we go. We got four true falses. Number one, uh, attachments can hide viruses or other uh, malware, this idea of uh, software sneaking in through an action and then uh, infiltrating your, your organization. That is true. Uh, it's absolutely true. Well done. Number two here, uh, legitimate companies should never request that you reset or up, update log information through links or an unsolicited email. Also that's, true. That's right. We just went through that. Be very suspicious of Netflix or others trying to up, you know, up reset your account for some unknown reason. Number three, how about this one? Uh, is it safe to click on a link as long as you don't initiate a download? That is false. That is, in fact, it's, it's hard to distinguish that in many cases, folks. When you click on the link, servers and IT infrastructure had been queried by that action to do stuff. It is not always a two-step process, so be aware of that. That's, a, that's urban legend, old news, maybe in the 90s that happened, but today, Everything's very active and very automated. So you click, you're in trouble. Don't, don't even think about that second step. And then how about this last one here? As long as, uh, as all the email names and do domains are spelled correctly, the email is probably safe uh, to answer back and respond to. I would say false under yes. the assumption that it was unexpected. If it Correct. was an expected email, you're probably okay. If it was an unexpected email from someone, then false. Right. Now, that's actually an old IT folk uh, gentleman taught me that long time ago. Uh, a lot of times hackers will just spam you to see if the email is still active. And by replying, even though you don't know why uh, what's going, it all appears clean. You've just told them, hey, I'm hearing them alive. So if it's unsolicited, doesn't make any sense, delete it and then go in your deletes and delete it again. Move on. Right. So well done, Jonathan. Man, you're, you're, I have to say, man. <laughs> 100% so far. This is great. All right. Uh, and anybody else wants to jump in? I mean, we can't let Jonathan have all the fun here. All right. So this is our cheat sheet. We don't have to walk through every word here, right? This is really meant as a summary, but look how much information we've already learned today, right? Email is noted quite a bit. Um, the idea of spelling errors, the idea of what's referenced, the idea of the sense of urgency and the sense of privacy. Lots of warning signs are in every spam email, right? Very important. See, I would hang this on my wall. This is new to you. Um, again, I highly encourage you to train your family as well. It's fun. Make IT fun. Make security fun. It really is a team sport. That's why I have a passion for calling this presentation a team sport. Now, why are these logos here? And, and you're know, like, Steve, I'm, I'm pretty low level. I don't do a lot of social. I know all this stuff. I'm, I'm real careful. Why do I even think that my information is out there? If you are using any of these apps or part of any of these networks, for example, if you're a Marriott customer and you have your number there and you're, you're a frequent flyer, so to speak, all these companies have been breached. Hundreds of millions of records of information have been leaked. Uh, it's, it's reality. And it happens all the time. Um, when Experian was leaked uh, and hacked a couple of years ago, I immediately started getting phone calls and I knew they were fake. Um, but, you know, 
So read the news. When you see an event, cross-check with your apps. Beware. Be even on more suspicious. So, uh, and these companies, that's the other thing. You think Marriott has a big IT budget? Sure they do. But think of all their touch points and, and think of all the ways they can get hacked. It's a complex problem. This is why we all should believe we're part of the solution. That's why we're here today again. So, okay, okay, there's a whole section here on passwords, folks. This is really important, right? I've already given you some of the answers. If, you, if you're an admin and using admin one, two, three, a kid from one of those countries can get into your system, right? You want to make it a little bit harder for them. And so, again, this means we have to step up. Passwords are a pain in the butt. They're hard. I have to remember them. They're, again, there are IT can help you with tools. Um, you can come up with your own trickery. Um, but... You know, whatever you're using, make sure it is itself protected and not just in, in, in the wild, as we say, in the clear. So uh, I'm going to go right to the examples because this is real important. Now, we don't, Jonathan, I'm not going to make you go through each one, but let's just look at a couple here. Let's look at the first one. Um, Domith 24 exclamation mark or D Smith, D Smith 24 exclamation mark. I bet you they were, they're 24. I bet you their first name is Don or or, 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 you know, it could be a woman too. Smith, clearly their name. And they thought that exclamation mark was tricky because the tool said you must use a special character. What do you think? Does that look like a strong password to you? No, that is not a strong password. Yeah. And it's, it's social engineering. Again, connect the docs, folks. If you're using names, kids, birthdays, pets, cities, schools, bad. You've got to make it hard. Let's look at this one over here. Uh, E4G was at three, I can't even read it, three, three B, two D, F, F, dollar sign. Of course, that's going to be hard to remember, <laughs> but it's going to be really hard to guess. You're not going to social engineer that password, right? So we don't need to dive into this. I'm just going to show you the answer. And you can see that's clearly a strong password. Tech Derek, obviously, he's proud of being technical. Um, bad, you, you know, um, GT, um, this one up here, or that it, clearly good. Um, if it's not a moniker, can it be a password? Aha, great question. I want to show you an example. This is from a friend of mine who's a CISO. This, this is a, it's not only fun, it gives you a sense of you can be creative and help yourself have a moniker that's still hard to convolve by using special characters as part of your vowels or consonants, right? Look at how he spelled hard to crack. First of all, that is going to be hard to crack. Second of all, it's easy to remember because you remember it's capital H, capital R, small d, oh, C, oh, that's right. I'm using the at simple for my crack, right? So get creative like this. This is allowed. And it's encouraged because, you know, you don't have to keep resetting your password. That's annoying. And, and so it, it, what I don't want you to take away is, wow, Steve said I have to make really hard, ugly passwords. No. Just be creative in using um, a mixture of characters that sound out to something that you can remember and you're still achieving the same goal. Very important. I hate to harp on passwords, folks, but it's so important because again, it ties together that idea of social engineering. All right. Ask a, we have a few questions. Well, let's, oh, let's stop and take questions. Fantastic. Oh, it's so Karen. awesome. Yeah. <laughs> we had one about piggybacking, which okay. I was like, what is that? But then Jonathan answered. So. What is piggybacking, everybody? Well, yeah, the simple answer is what, that's my example of walking through the gate and letting somebody in. That's the human. There you go. Right. That's awesome. Um, I, I suspect, and I, I have to, uh, I'll claim I don't know, I'm going to see if Jonathan knows. Do you know of an IT <clears throat> of piggybacking, Jonathan? With, uh, I mean, you could argue that a, an attachment is a way of piggybacking, but I, I think the word piggybacking really applied to people being let in, um, let them in uh, physically. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I have a casino background. So we had um, a lot of, uh, wow. they were called man traps, where you could not, you only allowed one person into the trap at a single time. You mm -hmm. were verified by uh, surveillance, and then you were able to go through the second door. So Perfect. people would try to piggyback, and then it would go under lockdown, and it was a whole thing. Okay, perfect. Interesting. Okay, right. one more question. Yeah, sure. Um, so Karen from Nevada PCA asks, what are the circumstances when a hard delete, shift delete, in parentheses, shift plus delete, is better than simply deleting to the trash can? Well, I think, um, 
I mean, the simple the simple way to answer that is I want people to delete twice. And I think that's the essence of the question. You don't want to just delete the email as the example. You want to go into your trash bin and delete it again. So that's what I, I think she means by hard delete. But either way, that's the answer. Delete twice or make sure that your first delete truly deletes it from your your um, your deleted bin. Why is that? Well, it's just the best practice, right? Uh, technically, once it's in the delete bucket, it could be inactive, but every IT person I've talked to says still delete it twice because you never know. You never know how creative those people can become. So ensuring you've clearly erased it from your world is the good goal. Don't just put That's, it in the delete bucket. Yeah. Thank right. you. Yeah. Really great question. That. Yeah. And that, that shows people are caring on this call. Look, we've already, we've already achieved goodness here today, folks. Look what it says on the top left. Stop and think, right? So uh, this is really important. And, and it's not just that action, it's all of your actions. And we, you know, it's hate, it, it, it's a terrible situation that we have to think this way, but it's all about protecting yourself and being aware. So um, I don't think there's any questions here. And I think we've hit a lot of this message. Um, that's right. So I just want to reinforce the idea of, please be careful what you put on your social media. Now we're going to have some questions coming up about being in a public company especially if you're in a public company, folks, you can get in trouble with your general counsel. You could potentially be hauled into court by the mm. commission for pumping and dumping stock and, and making bold claims. So, you know, let's, uh, let's just think that stuff through. Uh, on the right, we have an example here as well uh, that's pointing out some things, uh, you know, and it's a pretty obvious example, right? Hey, we're just finishing up our confidential presentation for, <laughs> you know, that be a little bit sneakier about, about that, right? Be a little bit more under the radar. Now, the same thing I mentioned with those other organizations, all these companies have been hacked too. So the more you're out using SaaS applications, the more eventually your information is going to be on the dark web, the white web. Uh, and, and, and it's all up to us to make sure that that information doesn't go anywhere by being smart about three things, passwords, being smart about what we click on and being aware of what we say, right? All right, uh, so I think this is kind of a summary slide before we transition. And um, does anything here stand out to you, Jonathan, that you'd like to, sh to share from the list? You go, hey, Steve, I, I, I like number four because. <laughs> well, um yeah i guess most of it makes sense you know it's one of those things where you really just do i guess have to be cautious more than anything else you have to be aware of the social platform you're posting on yeah. and i think what we really as a society need to realize too is even if you post something that is seemingly innocuous that you can also garner a lot of feedback on social media or it can be copy and pasted and used in a way against you. So it's trying to make sure that yeah. just because you post something only to your friends on Facebook, it might not only go to your friends because maybe they repost it and then it becomes public and then it gets spread out to everyone. Yeah, you are a wise man. And thanks for saying that. I actually like number four, just because I hear my mom <laughs> be respectful, you know, uh, but being cautious is the main takeaway for me. But everything that you just said is really important. What we don't realize is a lot of what we do interactively now in society can be, uh, quote unquote, go viral without our knowing it because of the way these applications work. And because we're so tied to so many systems today, remember the old movie from a couple of years ago, you know, it's in the cloud, right? And the couple did something that would, ended up in the cloud as a photograph that was a bit embarrassing. And that was a funny comedy and all, but I think it was reflecting on where we are. Once it's out there, guys, it's really hard uh, to get it back, uh, especially photographs and uh, or screen captures, because that's essentially a photograph. So um, I think one to one texting is is probably the safest thing. Social media is, is the worst place to share something that you're not sure whether how far it should go. All right. So beyond social media. Right. We've talked about company policies a bit. Uh, we've, uh, we've, we've talked about a way to find split malicious websites. We, you know, proof point is one great example as well as, uh, Google. And then, um, uh, the idea that anytime you're using a cloud application, uh, in your enterprise, your organization, you really want to make sure that it is participating in the policies and procedures around helping you protect that. And again, they're not trying to be an annoyance. 
They're trying to help you uh, actually, uh, again, build process around the data. Again, in the world of HIPAA, I, I think, again, there's a much higher propensity for us all to have that, that expertise, um, but take it to the next level. So the, Jonathan, you're off the hook on this one because I, I must have busted the animation, but let's go through it anyway, because it, it's always important to have, I, I think, Training without questions and answers to help reinforce this stuff, you know, it's a little bit better if we go through it. So let's look at the first question here as a team. So we have this person has a problem with a vendor and um, they're, I gotta move this video again, sorry about that. Uh, informing other employees about it through a post. She decides to discuss it with her supervisor instead. That's a great point, right? Um, escalate is the main message help inform your organization. And, and, and I think that's a great, again, we can't be ashamed of these things. And guys, if you, there shouldn't be no, I'll just say this, cause I had my laptop stolen. I had to work, walk into work the next day and say, hey, my $2,000 laptop that I just got two weeks ago, guess what? <laughs> it got stolen. It's embarrassing, right? But the reaction's not going to be from a great organization, you fool. It's gonna be, hey, let me help you. Uh, let's lock down all the apps. Let's change all your passwords. And let's get you a new laptop ordered, right? It, it really is something that happens very commonly. There should be no shame. And, and please, I, I, I've never been shamed when I've had that problem. People, people are used to it now, uh, and, and that's good. Next one here is the idea of, we've seen a message on Twitter, not feeling good about the sales quarter, <laughs> sales this quarter. Folks, if that's obvious, that's not a good thing to say. Right. Think about it, especially if you're in a compliance or go uh, government or um, public company. This is bad. This can get you in jail. Uh, this could have the FBI knock at your door. I kid you not. Be very careful about any claims like that. And your general counsel will thank you for not doing that. Uh, now, the last one here is the idea of um, uh, we're doing Internet blogging. And she's writing comments threatening uh, the blogger. Well, obviously that's not good, right? So um, again, be nice. Listen to Steve's mom, right? Uh, if you're unhappy with a social media post about yourself, your organization, uh, or anything that you're involved with, if you know the best thing to do is walk away. Probably the best thing to do. But if you do want to fight the battle, send them a direct message, right? You heard the uh, phrase DM them. DM them and say, hey man, that that you know. That was kind of uncool, <laughs> you know, uh, at least let them know. But that way it won't show up on the mainstream. And, and uh, again, even be careful with DMing people because they can make that public later, right? So the best thing to do is walk away and report it. Okay, uh, we're closing out here. We're getting close um, uh, to the end. Just let you know there's probably a few slides left. But this is, again, for those who are traveling, this is very important. And then we're going we're gonna to put, um, we're, we're going to put Jonathan on the spot because Jonathan, this is a multiple choice question here. And it's a little tricky, actually. I, I struggle with this, but I'll tell you why I think the answer is the answer. Um, so we've, we were doing, and there's some key, this is like we're back in the days of the SAT here. You have to really read the question, right? Uh, so the question here is essentially saying, I'm at the airport and I'm fooling around. I log into something, particularly an application, and I realize, oh, shoot, someone watched me do that. And then worse than that, I get on the plane and realize I left the darn tablet at the airport. So two mistakes were made. Um, that's a little bit of a hint, but what's the high level answer here? Jonathan, give it a go, give it your best shot. Gosh, the first thing that comes to my mind is were they connected to the internet without a VPN? Just for hacking possibilities. I love it, I love it, see, but, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's not an option. <laughs> well, I would say that, you know, using your mobile device in a public place is not a bad thing. You take precautions, a VPN yeah. in a public place. So your uh, packets, which are the data, cannot be um, intercepted by other yeah. individuals. The a valuable item of your company equipment was lost or stolen. I mean, that is unfortunate. Probably not the worst. Um, someone eavesdropped on your login codes. Well, cool. if you use those same passwords or login codes elsewhere, they might be able to write them down and just mm -hmm. mass spam them across websites and see what mm -hmm. they can get into. And a stranger viewed confidential material on your device. Why were you viewing confidential material on your device in a public place where someone else could see it? And especially yeah. if it was something like PPI, now you're at liability. So I would yeah. say last two. 
Uh, interesting. So I'm going to I'm going to ag agree that actually all four answers are correct, but I'm picking the the second one because I want to I want to trigger a certain response here, which is what's the first thing this process that we've trained ourselves today to do? If I've lost a valuable tool that has information that could be critical to my organization, my first action should be to immediately call the company and say, "My tablet's been stolen. I think someone might have seen my password for the document I was looking at." immediately protect those assets. Uh, that's the real answer that we don't have here. But when I talk to um, CIOs and CISOs about this, they agree that two is the best answer because they want people to make that emotional trigger that, oh my gosh, don't worry about the, the after effects, take action first to stop the floodgate from flooding, right? Because there's things called virtual desktops, central management of SaaS applications, IT has admin rights to all these applications and tools, and they can shut down your account. They can block all those passwords. They can protect everything from a single phone call. So at the end of the day, within minutes of that phone call, that device is now effectively dead. And anything that was locked is now unlockable because there's no password left for it. It's been shut down, right? So that's the real message. But I agree, Jonathan. I think a lot of these answers are accurate, actually. We're just doing a little bit of a brain twister here to have fun. All right. Um, Let's see, now we're back to um, a little bit of summary information here. Uh, we've talked about text messages, and I even mentioned that before, the SIM card attack on your phone. Be very, very weary. It's the same philosophy. Why would Citibank or AT&T be texting you about Apple gift cards or change your password or there's a new this or that? It's all bogus, and it's all meant to get you to click. Don't click, just delete. And, and again, if I, for whatever reason, I'm, a, I'm an attack vector, I, I get at least one bogus text a week and I delete them immediately. Um, the, uh, the request from familiar sites, we've talked about many examples, and we've also talked about the idea uh, of uh, it's just too good to be true. And I think we have a graphic here on the right. Uh, no, it's on the next slide. Uh, or it's on the slide coming up. I forget one. It's one. I know it's there. All right. So let's, uh, let's talk about this one. Uh, again, Jonathan, you're on the hook. Here we go. Uh, we're on a mobile secure device here, retreating that da 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 da. All right, what should we do here? Keep devices protected and secure them at all times, of course. Uh, be, ca uh, be cautious in public places. We talked about that. You really have to be careful about airports. I've had this experience myself where I realized someone was over my shoulder. And in fact, back in the old days when I had a calling card, someone was watching me dial. And an hour later, someone was using my number. So people sit in airports who simply steal information. Sad but true. Even hospital lobbies. I'm convinced of this. Stay current. We talked about that. Again, simple passwords, no good. Work with IT. Make sure the levels of administration are clean and clear. And um, actually, I don't think there's a question here for you, Jonathan, but I can certainly take a comment because you're a knowledgeable guy. It's fun to share with you here. Um, make sure the Wi-Fi system is well protected. We've talked through all those. I think those are all best practices. I thinking there was a quiz there. Ah, I was off one slide. I knew it. I knew there was another question coming up. Here we go. All right. Now we got to be tough on ourselves. We've got an example on the right and you can see quite a bit of information there. And uh, <clears throat> so we have to ask ourselves with the setup, you can read the setup. So question one, is it you're right? Both messages look legitimate. Two, sorry, both messages look suspicious. Three, bank account text looks okay, but the gift card text may be a scam. Or the bank account text is probably a scam, but the gift card text looks okay. What do you think? I would say both messages look suspicious only because there's been a rise in individuals trying to use SMS to send a code, then yep. ask you for that code for whatever account. So you send it back to them and now they have access to all of your systems. Yep. Yep. So you're going for number three? Well, no, I'm going for both look suspicious. I would okay, so you're going for three. You're, 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 you're not even talking. You're like, just forget this whole thing. This is a scam. <laughs> well, my thing is, was it expected? Yeah, well, was that's the exactly right. Was the message expected? Yeah. yeah. I mean, we could be really snarky here. Does anybody expect corporate America to just offer you something? <laughs> I mean, boy, does that not happen too much, right? So... Yeah, the Good Samaritan idea doesn't happen too often these days, folks. So it, it, it's, uh, again, we could debate this a bit, but the, the point, again, this was, was um, you know, my take on this is I want you to see that 
something looks okay, but when it's tied to something that doesn't make sense because of its timeliness, it's a scam. That's why I picked number three, but, but I think Jonathan, you're spot on. Um, the, the scenario itself just doesn't make sense. And, and that's the point, right? Be on your guard a little bit. Be a little untrusting of these technologies that we so embrace today is the, uh, is the big takeaway. Okay, so social engineering, this is more of a summary here. And, um, and I think we've walked through a lot of these points, but I'm just gonna kind of knock off some ideas. What you say and do publicly is not just fun for your friends and family, it is a way for people to build a profile about you. Whether you call it the piggybacking example, or whether you call it someone calling into your institutions and trying to pretend they're you because they have your social security number and they know enough about you to beg that person, please, I just lost my assets. I don't know what to do, but it's me. Please trust me. You can probably wear down some of these people in these call centers, right? The more you try and the more you cry and the more emotion you show and somebody will eventually potentially let you in. So um, they're being trained to prevent that and be really hard about it. Uh, but, um, you know, you never know, right? So be careful. My example of this is I was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, but when Apple got breached many years ago and I lost all my iTunes, I called in, I got to the fourth supervisor and I said, look, I'm me. I'm happy to come down to Apple headquarters with my passport. And the guy told me, he said, Steve, I can tell it's you but I can't let you in. I can't give you your tunes back because your city of birth is spelled wrong. And unless you can tell me how you misspelled it, I can't give you your account back. Think about that for a minute. I spelled it wrong. So A was embarrassing, but B, that guy was good. He deserved a raise. I was really upset with him <laughs> at that moment, but you know, Hey, that that's the real deal. All right. The flight back, uh, this is kind of fun. Um, and um, again, let's make sure we're not repeating over and over again. I wanna make sure we call out some good stuff here. Um, I, think, um, I think this is another good example of, of the Steve's point about HR and IT, right? Um, when you see something that doesn't add up, uh, it's, it's important to flag it to your organization support teams. I think um, this idea of a code word uh, and, and um, asking people, th this is actually, uh, this is important. We do this in my company um, when we're making sure, right? Uh, there, there is information that your internal teams will know when somebody wants a way to test the system. If they're accessing things and they're emailing people, you can get around that. But, you know, that's one process that, that I think works. And um, it's also very important how you share passwords. And in my company, we're a security company, folks. We do not send both parts of the credentials the same way. We'll send password in one stream, think Slack, and we'll send the email or the other, uh, the, the actual, um, you know, the login name, if you will, through another vehicle. So they're two separate streams of data. Very hard to hack two things at once, right? So that's a little best practice. But be careful about just sending things like that throughout your organization without thinking through who's got access to the information because you're giving people the crown jewels. All right, that's it for the main section. There's uh, three slides in the back uh, that are fun downloads because we're at time and they're just a self-test, right? Again, because the more you practice it and you think about it, uh, the more you're gonna help save, uh, save yourself or your organization from an, an, an environment that is only painful, right? There's no fun in recovering from a breach uh, it's very stressful, and uh, it's also a legal event for your shareholders or your, your any, any fiduciary responsibilities that you have, your patients, your customers, and, uh, and people can lose their jobs over this if it's truly embarrassing. So uh, it's uh, thank you for listening, by the way, and I hope everybody's gotten at least a couple of tricks to be more secure even in your home. Any comments from the team here? Jonathan, Karen, Brandy in, in particular. Uh, somebody asked, uh, Karen White asked if we could get slides. So absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> that would make and me smile. Cause the, again, a lot of these are just fun to stack, tack up on your wall as reminders of things to do or not do. And Jonathan at, uh, put a comment in the chat, honeypot networks. That sounds rather nefarious. Oh no. <laughs> Honeypots are interesting though. Uh, so the idea of a honeypot <clears throat> is actually 
um, it's meant to attract bees in the real world, right? Um, and, and cybersecurity companies will put out honeypots as a means to attract hackers, um, many reasons, to learn, to gain insights on their tactics, uh, to divert them from the real assets. There's even something called a deception sensor or sandboxing. Sandboxing is another term. And they're all aimed at helping people quarantine or provide a, a path for hackers to go to that IT is actually set up as traps. There, there's, lots of, there's lots of best practices there, deep, deep, deep into IT uh, management of resources and things. But all those terms kind of get back to the same point of how to contain the hacker, how to learn from them so that we can develop best practices to uh, keep them at bay for their when they have advanced attacks. That's great. Thank you. All right. Well, I have one question for you. Uh, as far as resources go, you had mentioned a website that you could go to to uh, scan links. Uh, now, I personally use a website called virustotal.com. Oh, uh, throw them files and URLs, and uh, you can do searches for, um, you know, file hash or what have you. Are there any other links or any other resources you might be able to provide for our listeners or for some of these health centers that um, you know might be looking for that resource or repository of information just to double check that email or double check the attachment without opening it? Yeah, I think Jonathan, you know, there's lots of sites like the one that you referenced run by organizations or just what's called a white hacker, not a black hacker. Uh, and, um, and then there's the commercial folks like Proofpoint and others who put up whole businesses around helping people uh, tr attract the bad domains and maintain a library of them. Um, that obviously costs money, but the Department of Homeland Security has a feed site as well. I think the simplest answer for, for lay people is really just to trust Google uh, because Google, <laughs> their passion has become the library for the world. And, and, and you'd be surprised what, if you type in just is this a bad URL? Is this a bad domain? As a question, you drop in the domain. You'll get you'll get reasonable answers back. So um, we can cobble together a list for the team. We can send that back later today if that's helpful. But mm -hmm. I think uh, between the one that you gave, um, the the for profit guys like Proofpoint and and uh, part, you know again our own government does a good job. The Department of Homeland Security publishes these things and publishes a feed. Um, but if you want to keep it simple, Google it first. No, that sounds great. If you uh, are able to provide a little list, sure. that would be a phenomenal resource that we can put on our Nonopod page and uh, share with our emergency preparedness uh, contacts. All right, so I will go ahead and wrap up our session. If there's any additional questions uh, to anyone who's listening or if this is posted on our YouTube channel, uh, please reach out and um, we'll be more than happy to uh, follow up and get those answers for you. But thank you, everyone, for attending today's training. You will receive a survey on this session, and we would appreciate it if you could complete the survey and provide feedback. If you have any further questions as discussed, please contact me, Jonathan McDowell, at jmcdowell at nvpca.org. I will also put my email in the uh, chat box here. On behalf of the Nevada Primary Care Association, thank you for joining us and have a great rest of your day. Thank you yet again, Steve, and thank you, Karen. Phenomenal presentation. I give you an A, a as well. <laughs> well, you're too kind. Look, that, don't let that stop the folks from giving us critique because we're in training. And what does training mean? It means we want to make it better. We're, we have Always. folks and, and your feedback will make sure it's better for the next group. We really appreciate that. We want to make this a, a rolling thunder of goodness. So all feedback is welcome. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thanks, guys. All right. Have a great day. Uh-huh. Bye.